five. We are going live. Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. I am your host Daniel Maynard and today we shall be discussing the Empire of Trebizond, specifically its attempt in 1204 to 1206 to take Constantinople and its defeat as one of the contenders in the imperial contest for the throne after 1204 and in 1214 with the capture of Sinope. With me is Mark. Mark. Could you explain to our audience a little bit about your Empire of Trebizond credentials, please? Oh, well, 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 good evening, uh, everyone, on this fine April uh, evening. Um, I'm um, I'm a graduate of a, a ancient history degree, and for my and I am a, quite the time file. Uh, and for my dissertation. Uh, for my final uh, dissertation for my uh, degree, I decided to uh, write about the importance of Christianity to, uh, to the imperial ideology of the Empire of um, which was an interesting topic because, you know, Trebizond's quite a neat, you know. Uh, it's quite a unique and, empire, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes, mm. it is. It is, it is, it is that a merging of cultures, which is one of the most interesting things about it, between the Caucasus, the Middle East, and of course uh, Byzantium. Yeah, it's uh, certainly an empire that catches the imagination. I know that Cervantes uh, mentions the empire of Trebizond in his Don Quixote, so it just kind of goes to show that. Even this little empire that there's not that much information for has a certain legendary quality to it almost. Anyway, yeah. since we are talking about the foundation of this particular empire, shall we go through the events of its foundation? Uh, yes, I mean you're 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 the you're the expert at uh, this, so uh, I'll leave it. Okay. So, indeed. So what I'll do is I shall go through the events, um, and then after that we can discuss them. Yes, yes, by all means, by all means. So, so our story begins in 1185 with the deposition of Andronicus the First Comnenus, who was lynched uh, by a usurpation by Isaac the Second Angelos. His grandsons, Alexios and David Comnemnus, who were the sons of Andronicus's son, Manuel the Sebastocrator, fled Constantinople to escape retribution from Isaac Angelos. Above anyone else, they were the, more, they were the most legitimate members of the main branch of the Comnemnian family. After the coup, their mother, the wife of Manuel the Sebastocrator, who is most likely Rusidan of Georgia fled with her sons to her homeland in Georgia, where they grew up and once old enough set about the conquest of their birthright. Although some historians have believed that they hid in Constantinople for twelve for twenty years, this seems very unlikely. The right the right wise emperor would be I think I find it doubtful that I that Isaac II would allow the proper heirs of the empire to remain in the capital for so long. Also, neither of them were used in any of the subsequent rebellions which had pseudo Alexios II and also the coup of John the Fat in 1200 or 1201. So, they escaped, but their escape is lost to history. But it is likely that their mother managed to reach a ship with both of them and sail to Georgia. And then after 1185, they're not heard again until April 1204. In April 1204, Alexios and David went to Georgia to seek help. Their paternal aunt, Tamar the Great of Georgia, gave them an army of Georgian allies to lead an expedition into Roman territory. 
Unlike the Eastern Roman Empire, Georgia was experiencing a golden age at that time, and was more than capable of giving two young adventurers an army and resources. Alexios and David occupied Lazica, Trebizond, and a few other cities in their initial expedition. Alexios I was himself about 22 years old at that time, and his family was very popular in the Pontic area. This is partially because the Comnemnus family originated from there, and Andronicus Comnemnus, before he became emperor, resided at Ornion, and was essentially a local governor of that area beforehand. So there were fresh local loyalties to the imperial family beforehand that they were able to exploit. Sinope and Onion joined Alexios and David. This local loyalty should also be seen in the wider context of the fragmentation of the Eastern Roman Empire before the fall of Constantinople. This is because the central government was failing to provide external and internal security both from raids from the Turks and from raids from tax collectors. Those officials that did come from the emperor were usually tax collectors out to extort as much money as possible from the populace. Local aristocrats who wielded considerable power in their areas due to the nature of the Comnenian system took it upon themselves to provide a solution, and this can be said to be the case for Trebizond. In the east alone, Aldebrandinus seized, con seized control of Italia, Theodore Mungarfus had taken control of Philadelphia, Mav uh, Manuel Mavrazomis had seized the Meander Valley, and Theodore Loscaris had fled to Nicaea. While Alexios remained in Trebizond, consolidating his position, David continued east with his Georgian allies and native mercenaries. David captured Paphlagonia and became its ruler, but was still in partnership with Alexios. David had extended Comnemian hegemony all the way to Pontic Heraclea in about 1205. Within a few months, Comnemian power stretched from Lazica in the east to Heraclea in the west. Fittingly, Adep Alexios at some point adopted the name Grand Comnemnus. The opponents that Alexios and David now faced were Theodore Lascaris Lascar in Nicaea, the Seljuk Turks of Iconium to the south, and the Latins who controlled Nicomedia. Unfortunately, things went downhill almost immediately. Sultan Caicos Raw I attacked Trebizond and besieged it in 1206. David, in the meantime, launched a campaign on under the command of a, a person called Sanardinus against Nicomedia, which had just been abandoned by the Latins. The Nicaeans had recently occupied it after the Latins had just left. However, Nicomedia, which was one of the empire's most important cities in the east, was imperative to take for David because it would be the staging ground for the recapture of Constantinople. Sinardinus was ambushed and captured by Theodore Lascaris. David's ambitions for further expansion was quashed, having lost one of his armies, something he could ill afford to do. Theodore then launched an invasion of Paphlagonia, besieging David's capital of Heraclea, and Pelusius defected to Theodore Lascaris. David solicited the aid of the Latins as allies, and they, in turn, attacked Nicomedia. Terry of Luz captured Nicomedia from Lascaris, which forced him to turn back. After the reconquest of Nicomedia, the Latins returned to Europe to face the Bulgarians that had themselves invaded. David paid for their aid by sending the Latins several ships full of wheat and meat. The destruction of David Comnemnus's army by Theodore must have been so devastating that he swore fealty to the Latin Emperor of Constantinople in an attempt 
to gain further aid against Lascaris. This subjection took the form of David being included in the Emperor's treatise, treaties and correspondence. He was in effect another feudal lord. David in 1206 launched a new raid against the Nicaeans, pillaged several villages and took prisoners from around Pelusius. His contingent of 300 Frankish allies were ambushed by Andronicus Gidos, possibly the future emperor Andronicus I Gidon, in the mountain pass near Nicomedia, where they were all massacred. In 1208, the Latins directed their army to Chalcedon. Chronically short of manpower themselves, the Latins around remained in Asia only long enough for Theodore to abandon his second siege of Heraclea before returning to Constantinople. Then Theodore took a mastress, Kitoros and Cromna, and the surrounding countryside. David's new frontier now stood at Cape Corambis, west of Sinope, which was now David's headquarters. The Battle of Nicomedia and the Battle of the Rough Pass obliterated David Comnemnus's military power. He could not get aid from Trebizond because they themselves were busy with the Turks. In the summer or autumn of 1214, Sultan Caicus Raw I attacked Sinope. He captured the city, killed David, who commanded its defence. Then Alexios I led a campaign and retook Sinope and its environs. Alexios I was captured during a hunt in the area by the Turks and after being tortured in front of the city walls, Sinope surrendered itself to Caicos Raw. In exchange, the populace, in exchange, Alexios was returned to Trebizond. Alexios had to become a vassal of the Turks and pay an annual tribute of 12,000 hyperpora, 500 force horses, 2,000 cows, 10,000 sheep, and 550 bundles of gifts. In exchange, the Sultan recognized Alexios as ruler of Trebizond, in effect guaranteeing its independence. Sinope was surrendered on the 1st of November 1214, and thus ended Trebizond's imperial aspirations. The borders of the empire in the west now were set at the river Iris near Firmadon in the east. They were set at Soteropolis. Alexios I had, in the intervening years of expansion and decline, managed to gain the, subject the subjugation of the former Roman Crimean provinces in Cherson and Gothia. And that concludes the series of events. So Mark. Mark? Hello? Yes, yes, I do apologise. Your, your your microphone went a tiny bit funny then, but uh, ah. that, might just, that might have just been on my end. Uh, we have, we apologise for any technical difficulties. Blame YouTube. Anyway, so... Um, I, I mean, I... Be, be, any before, comments? Before we get going, I would um, just like to... Uh, I mean, me, me and... Um, uh, for the for the your your good loyal listeners, uh, me me and they all do 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 have quite frenzied discussions uh, about this, um, and um, the I assume we're going to get on to uh, Andronicus Gidon's uh, identity, but um, I would I would just point out that in my view, uh, Trebizond's uh, imperial ambition. I think there, there, was, there was still an ambition there until 1282. Mm. I think there is still an ambition throughout the most of the 13th century for them to get to Constantinople, get the Comnenian dynasty back on the throne on the throne of the Roman Empire. Um, but of course, you know, with the 1282 events, which I don't know if we're covering uh, in this one, but the, 12, the events of 1282 are the the reason why um, that that's why I, 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 that is the end of their imperial ambition is 1282 rather than mm. 
rather than the, the death of uh, Alexius. Although, if Gaidon is the uh, the general in question, of course, um, the the general who defeated uh, David's march west, then it would make sense for there to be a period of peace with Trebizond and the uh, uh, Nicene mm. Empire. Yes, it was Manuel the first uh, Grand Cabnemus that revived those imperial ambitions. But I think, in some ways, the whole we're going to retake Constantinople kind of dies in 1214. Yes. Or, or at least in I mean, 1206. But, I mean, Trebizond itself is a it's an interesting um, mm. subject, because what separates these two brothers and their descendants from various other usurpers who have risen in the east and tried to take the throne. What makes these 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 you know at this time they're not they're not that old, but what makes them so so uh, so fascinating? And in my view is partly the name and also Condemnus. and also the longevity of their empire. Um, mm. But of course, it all starts with these two, um, these two uh, uh, young men, uh, George, uh, not George, <laughs> David and Alexius. Yes. Um, which um, before, I do. Uh, I, I was just going to uh, no continue um, because um, Vasiliev does a very good article on the foundation of Trebizond. Uh, yes, and they should be able to read it online free on JSTOR, and it's it's very good read. Yeah. Um, it's very good. It's it's quite in depth and quite clear and concise, and it's very good. It brings it together a lot of foreign language um, pieces as well, which is always good. So, um, so I think the bottom line with the events is that they try. And things go horrifically badly for them. But I think it could have been worse. It c it could have been lost. Well, it could have they could have lost their empire. But uh, it's probably down. It's probably because of them Trebizond's position and also the emperor that the empire actually did survive beyond just mm. its mean... initial foundation. Like a lot of other principality like um successor principalities like Leo Seguros and uh Theodore Mangarfus and that lot which mm. had very short um tenures as their own rulers. Yes. Um I mean you got to remember the site of Trebizond itself is is a extremely defensible one. Yeah. Well, it's, it's virtually impossible to attack properly. Um Although, although, of course, a, a lot, a lot to do try over over the years. Yeah. Um, but the, it's in good, well, good for them, hilly terrain. It's, 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 it's far enough east that you know, one, once the Nicians get back to Constantinople, it's, 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 it's going to be hard for them to interfere mm. in that part of the world uh, anymore. Um, yeah, that's the other thing. Why I think. Both Trebizond and Nicaea lose interest in each other because after Sinope is gone, Trebizond's mm. like a world away compared to yes. Nicaea and Constantinople and Epirus as well. But you, you've also got to take into account Trebizond is at the very end of the Silk Road. Yes. There's a tremendous amount of wealth flowing through uh, the city. Mm. I know um, Vasiliev made a good point that although. Trebizond may not have had the military strength. It was economically far more powerful than Nicaea because it had all of this trade and commerce coming into the city. The city itself could support the empire, whereas Nicaea, the city of Nicaea, could not support the empire on its own. It needed. Yeah. It relied on the countryside around it to, I mean, for its, it's economy. Which it's, I thought was a, very interesting. 
In, indeed, it, I mean it's a it's a topic for another another mm. video. I expect the 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 court, the Ny Nicene court though, is is a very interesting. Um, mm. There's a quite a bit of intrigue. Um, I thought I was bringing some Panaretos, if uh, if that's uh, okay with yourself. Yes, um, yes, go ahead. I'm sure you, as, our as listeners would be very interested to hear um, the Trebizond is, historian. There is a paragraph basically in uh, Michael Panaretos uh, devoted to um, to these events. There's a paragraph. Yes. Um, and for those of uh, you uh, your who do not know who Michael Panaretos is, he's um, he was a 14th century uh, secretary of um, I, thought I can't remember the emperor off the top of my head. Alexius the um, Third. Yeah, there we go. Um, and he basically did a. It's more of a chronology. It's a chronicle. In yeah, chronicle. Essence. That's that's the word. You you. It is a chronicle of the Trapezantine emperors. Mm. Um, but it does it does flesh itself out a little bit when it oh, comes to oh, yeah. Michael's when, when, own time. Yes, um, the Greek in it is very difficult because the Greek of Trebizond over time over the centuries of the empire's existence morphed into the Greek was already an interesting um, dialect in that area, but it morphed into this sort of I mean it's what we call Pontic Greek now, and it's it's quite hard mm. to read in the original. Um, but luckily, we we now do have two translations of it uh, about now, which is uh, Mark. Would you like to read out the paragraph about the uh, foundation? Yes. Well, I'll also read out the title of the work because it's it's, it's quite a great um, title. I'll I'll do it in English. Um, <laughs> On the emperors of Trebizond, the Grand Comnemnoi, how, when, and how long each of them reigned. It's a good great title. title. Um, so, Lord Alexius the first. The Grand Conemnos left the blessed city of Constantinople and set out on campaign from Georgia with an army provided by the zeal and efforts of his paternal aunt Tamar. He came to Trebizond and captured it in April. Indication 7 1204, at the age of 22. After he had reigned 18 years, he died on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, February the 20th, 1222, aged. 40. And that is it. That is all we have uh, for these particular events in Panaretos' uh, chronicle. Mm. Much of the rest relies on more contemporary historians. Although, I will mention something about the dating, which is quite interesting. So, in a previous video about the fragmentation of the empire, I mentioned the Partitio Romane. And it's interesting that in that partitio, which is, it was a kind of apportioning out of the possessions of the Byzantine Empire by the Crusaders in uh, the date itself is uh, a bit funny, but 1204-1205, round about then. And interestingly, Trebizond is not mentioned in the Partitio Romani, which suggests that by the time they made it, Alexios had already established himself in Trebizond and was no longer sending taxes to the empire. This is also true of places like uh, Corinth and also um, Atalia, which had already broken away under their local rulers. So I think that's an interesting uh, thing to mention. Uh, yes, and um, and the one thing, the event which you can't underestimate is the support of um, Queen Thamar. Or yes, Tamar, it's... Georgia is crucial in this. Yes, in fact, I've I've come up with quite a a few notes about Georgia. If you don't no, mind no, no, me no, going by, through by them, no, by all means. And do feel free to pitch in at any time, Mark. So Georgia. Um, oh, Mark, before we before I dive in, and I'll leave this as a question for you to ponder: Was Alexios and David's exped initial expedition a Georgian 
expedition. Now I'll leave you to ponder <laughs> that. So I'll, I'll I'll go through this and uh, see what happens. So elect so Georgia has been around for ages at this point, and the they uh, the Byzantines and Georgians have had relations in the past. Um, for instance, Maria of Alania, who was a Georgian princess in the 11th century, married Michael VII and Nikiforos III, um, and also was a sort of godmother, despite being like a year younger than Alexios I Comnenus. Anyway, um, but and relations heat up again, so to speak, when Andronicus I Comnenus appears at the Georgian court in 1170 and he was very cordially received by King George III of Georgia who honoured him as an imperial prince at his court because um, this was the cousin of the emperor sort of thing. Uh, Andronicus participated in some Georgian military campaigns as well so he was laying down the seeds of good relations, so to speak. Eventually, Andronicus leaves Georgia and then takes up residence with the Turks of Iconium, which is the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. And, uh, but it's George III's warm welcome to Andronicus that I think is very interesting, which implies that Georgia and the Empire were, had very close relations, or at least the Georgians with the Comnemnian family had very warm relations. Possibly even specifically Andronicus himself. Uh, although the Byzantines didn't make much of that good relation. But that's a topic for another time. And it it could be speculated that Andronicus the first's first wife was Georgian. Um, Vasiliev does actually mention this point and he says that, so, Mark, you know David Comnemnus? Um, yeah, w which one? <laughs> Precisely. So, there are three David Comnemnoi that appear in the history of Byzantine Empire, um, sort of, that we, that have some sort of role that we know about. All three of them are related to Andronicus I in some way, which Vasiliev believed was part of Andronicus I's personal relationship to Georgia. Hmm. The first David Comnemnus that appears is a relative of his who is given command of Thessalonica during the Norman invasion in 1185. Um, then the next one is of course his grandson who appears and then of course the last emperor of Trebizond is also called David but this name which is a Georgian name and there are several kings called David etc doesn't really appear in Eastern Roman history as a sort of common name until after or around Andronicus the first. Just something for food for thought. Um, so also Alexios Comnemnus, who was the one of the sons of Andronicus the first, had actually lived in Georgia prior to that. And then when Andronicus seized control of Constantinople in eleven oh two he um, joined his father and then after the the coup in 1185 he returned to Georgia and also was considered as a husband for Tamar the Great. Um, so th there is a kind of knitting together of relations between Georgia and the Comnemnian family, specifically Andronicus I and his close family. Um, Manuel Comnemnus the Sebastocrator, who is the father of our two protagonists, was actually married to 
the sister of Tamar the Great, Rusidan of Georgia, and escape with them back to Georgia. Um, which would explain why Michael Panaretos, as Mark read out, says that Tamar the Great was their paternal aunt. I mean, you could believe that there was some magical sister also happened to be called Tamar that existed, but, you know, we know of, there's this woman we know called Tamar. It's probably her. Anyway. Um, so. Well, I mean, I, I just want to make the comment that go I, ahead. Had not, I had not, and of course now I know, and now I know, of course. Well, I, I knew, like, I know, you know, I mean, like, I subconsciously knew. Or, of course, all the David's, David Gordon and Noy are related to Andronicus the First. Hmm. That's fascinating, isn't it? Um, yeah. But I just saw a question uh, come up, which I, I would In like the to comments. Ask. Yes. Uh, did the emperors of Trebizond address themselves as emperors of uh, Trebizond? Um, Go ahead, Mark. Although, although we're dealing with the foundation in this particular episode, I. I I, I, I um, let me get up the. Um, basically, they uh, they stylize themselves as the emperor and despot of the Romans um, until so they 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 regard themselves as legitimate Roman emperors um, and wanted all of the pomp and circumstance associated with that title. But in 1282. Um, John the Second, Emperor of Trebizond, as as we call him, uh, I believe, married the daughter of Michael the Eighth of Paleologos um, in Constantinople. I believe. Yes. Um, and as part of these marriage negotiations, he relinquished, so to speak, the title of uh, Imperator uh, Romanum, or of course the uh, Greek. Uh, Basileus Robanoi. Yes, I was, I was just about to say that. Um, and instead, he wanted to be called Basileus and autocrat of all of Anatolia, the Iberias, the Peratea, and the East. Um, and of course, once that happens, it basically sort of it is, is, is him admitting subservience, so to speak. Um, mm. And I've always been interested to wonder whether or not did uh, John the Fourth lay claim to the title of Roman Emperor again? And I've never been able to find out that the answer to that did well, after. Oh, that's a very did, interesting did, question. Actually. Did John the Fourth? And I've ne I have not been able to find out the answer to that question. Um, so I hope I hope that helps uh, a bit with uh, that particular. Because John the Fourth was did take up the mantle as the leader of orthodoxy with John the Eighth when John the Eighth became yes. Catholic. It's very interesting yes. actually. Yes. Um, but but um, a topic for another time, I'm afraid. Indeed. 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 Um, I like Trepezon, there's so much we can do anyway. Oh, well, <laughs> um, and uh, another I I'd like also just because I know a lot of the coinage. Um, hmm. If I may, uh, Daniel, uh, just go uh, ahead. Be be my guest. We we don't actually have the, 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 it's rather upsetting, uh, especially uh, for those of us who are interested in the Empire of Trebizond. Um, that we we have because coins are always some of the best sources for uh, looking at at uh, empires throughout throughout history, really. Um, and Trebizond, unfortunately, we do not have coins for Alexios and David. Um, and indeed, there, there is there is some some fact as to what exactly is David's status in all of this. Um, is, is it always, is peculiar. Yes. Um, but um, before we answer that, I, I just want but the coin wise, uh, Andronicus Guidon. We have a lot of coins of Andronicus Guidon. And it seems that he reminted the coins uh, of Alexius, hmm. uh, but they were clipped somewhat. Um, ah, so he'd based it. Yes. Because uh, clipping, just for our viewers, clipping 
in pre-paper money times is a form of debasing the currency. I, I have a good example of this. Um, there is a coin, there is a follis, which is a bronze coin with a hint of silver in it, of Constantine the Tenth Ducus from the 11th century, and it's actually been clipped around the edges, so the sides of it have actually been cut off to make it weigh less, making the money worth less. And um, a lot of sort of economic history for the Byzantine Empire, when they say, and then this emperor to base the currency, is based on evidence like that. The sources mm. themselves don't mention that. There, there isn't a in this year, Constantine the Ninth decided to reduce the amount of silver in the currency. No, this is based on coins that have been clipped, the weighing of coins, how much they weigh is a very large hyperperon made of yeah. gold of Alexios the First, weighing the same as some sort of weird pewter thing made by Andronicus the Third, two several centuries later. No, so I mean, that, that's the, that kind of. Yes, um, history. But I mean, the the the, the comment I um, there I I do not know of mm. any example of a non-clipped coin with guide on on. Mm. Uh, there could be, so I'm not going to say there isn't any. There very well could be, and um, because you know the field of numismatics moves quickly. Um, yes, but. Based on the vast majority of examples, you 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 see how expensive uh, war making was at that time. I think it's quite a good hmm. study in it um, because it, there's a great study it, it, by Mark Bartusis that goes into the economy of late Byzantine warring. Yes. That one of the reasons why they couldn't support a large army was because a it was ultra expensive and b the Romans themselves didn't have that all that much money to actually spend on it. But anyway, mm. I just uh, want to finish this bit about Georgia, which I think is very uh, interesting. Yes, sorry, I do apologise. I, I, and I, then I, you can, and then you can. Uh, <laughs> yes, quite. So, um, so one of the reasons why Georgia may have helped the Comnenus brothers is because Alexios the Third Angelos perhaps one of the worst emperors of the Byzantine Empire, or a member of his government, decided to seize the generous arms of Queen Tamar the Great of Georgia. So these arms were being sent to monasteries in the Aegean Sea in the winter or maybe the spring of 1203, or the winter of 1202. It is possible that Tamar the Great started to organise an expedition under Alexios and David, who, if we assume is, the events are accurate, were already in Georgia by that point, to invade after she heard about the siege of Constantinople by Alexios IV and the Fourth Crusade in July of 1203. Because I think there is some weight to this, because A, how do they put an army together in to invade, only finding out that Constantinople is being filled with crusaders, or being attacked by the Fourth Crusade days or weeks before. It's just logistically not possible, unless they did it at some point beforehand. In which case, what was the reason for doing this expedition now, compared to the 20 years beforehand? And B, what, how long would it take for them to get ready? Now, I think, I think there's something to this. Yes. So, to answer those two questions, A, the government itself was ver of Constantinople was very weak. C, all of the problems that were happening at the time. Um, and the central government was very distracted, especially with that Fourth Crusade, and it would be a prime opportunity for Alexios and David to launch a military expedition in all of this. 
so I think so Vasiliev puts the argument and I think this is a very good argument that Tamar the Great inspired inspired by the seizure of her arms to these orthodox monasteries plus the weakness of the Byzantine Empire plus the strength of her own kingdom inspires her to take advantage of the siege of Constantinople in 12, 1203 with the deposition of Alexios III to organize an expedition with the two Komnenos brothers to try and either retake Constantinople or take a lot a, a sizable portion of the empire for themselves or for her mm. um. and so when they do decide to go on this expedition it's finally ready and it happens slightly before the fall of Constantinople I think it's it's not a case of they heard of the Crusaders attacking Constantinople in 1204 and then decided to do it, but rather they heard of it in 1203 and Tamar the Great goes alright boys, let's get ready, kind of thing. Yes, I, 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 I and do agree. Which, although coincidences don't usually happen, I think this is a case of coincidence that by the time their expedition actually sets off, but maybe they heard that, oh no, the Crusaders are attacking Constantinople. Their expedition would have happened anyway in 1204, despite uh, whether or not Alexios IV had been able to pay off the Crusaders or not. Um, yeah, no, I agree with your chronology. Mm. Um, and it's undoubtedly, undoubtedly, I mean... It, it, yeah. The fact that even in a paragraph, Panaretos mentions uh, Tamar, hmm. um, like it's undoubtedly Georgian backed, undoubtedly. Um, what is? What is uh, David's and Alexius's grand expedition westwards? Um, hmm. um, but whether or not we can call it a Georgian invasion um, is. It's it's problematic, I, I would mm. say, um, because the wealth of Trebizond would make you know, it. The wealth of Trebizond would mean surely the because uh, there's no evidence of uh, Trebizond ever funneling money into Georgia. I mean, although obviously Tamar, I believe, dies in twelve thirteen. Twelve twelve. Uh, well, but there, there's no evidence of money being funneled into Georgia's like tribute. Um, usually Trebizantine tributes head south mm. or uh, or west. Um, Only but... when they're being threatened by the king of Georgia. As mm. a case of George IV threatening to annex Lazica mm. and but... Alexius I gives him money. Yes, but I mean in terms of like but regular... In regular that things. case, they're not exactly on friendly terms anymore. No. Um, but yes, I, I, so I, meant, I, meant, I meant tribute in the in terms of like regular. Yeah, you know, they weren't vassals in, in the no. strict sense of the word. And, no, and this is an empire which does spend most of its existence as a vassal of one power or another, um, mm. either the Turks or the um, Mongols or so on, um, or briefly the Latins in twelve oh six. That's David mm. Commandments. Anyway. I, I briefly wanted to mention Theodore Ga Ga Gabras, um, who, of yeah. course, um, uh, this isn't the first time Trebizond is sort of independent. Um, or, the, or the second time, because <laughs> yes. Constantine Gabras, who is a son of Theodore, um, rebels from John II. Yes. And he is his own ruler, basically, until John beats him up and retakes Trebizond. But um, I always remember uh, Theodore Gabras. Um, I, I forgot what history it's in. It might be the Alexia. Um I know. Uh, uh, yeah, um, Anna Komnemlin does go over the whole Theodore Gabras yes, affair um, in depth. Yes, yes. Um, 
it 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 would be unfair though to say that Trump secessionist uh, as a as a as a uh, Trump sometimes as people have secessionist uh, views. Mm. Um, is is but it, it, the the it's just interesting that they always seem obviously because of the huge wealth which is flowing into it. I think a lot of histories of the empire do underestimate the sheer amount of money they were getting uh, there. It was so wealthy and. Uh, and you know, like if if you've got money, then you know you've got you know, if you're not dependent on the uh, Constantinople for uh, uh, mm. for administering your realm, then you know there's 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 the, oh there's, yeah, there's I reason, mean the the whole there's a reason why why Trebizond is often the centre. Yeah. Uh, of um in the, of of the vaults and rebellions of of many kinds, especially after, um, <clears throat> especially after the ten seventies, it becomes so detached from the center, um, mm. because the Comnenian emperors just can't be asked to reconquer, or actively don't want to reconquer central Anatolia. Um, that Trebizond is perpetually this. Almost completely, the like the the arse end of the empire for the rest of its hin history, which certainly has uh, something to do with its tendency for separatism. Mm. Um, but also, I think one of the reasons, especially for this instance, why Alexios and David were able to accomplish so much in so short a time. I mean, they were able to take the whole of the Pontic. Pontus region in a year, two years, is um, a number. One, there are Comnemnus, and the last Comnemnus that was there was Andronicus I, who uh, A, had been the governor there locally. The Comnemnoi had originated from Pon the Pontic region, Castamon, and also. Um, Although the reign of Andronicus I was a, a bloody reign of terror, that was largely centred in and around Constantinople, whereas the provinces themselves were less affected by Andronicus's cruelty. And also, and we do know that Andronicus issued reforms to try and um, rectify the growing corruption in the provinces. Uh, this is known about uh, the Hellenic provinces. It's not known if he also applied this to other provinces as well. Um, but after Andronicus I, where certainly decent government for places like Trebizond, you had Isaac, you had the Angelos emperors that couldn't give uh, stuff about the provinces, so long as they were paying money. And so when Alexios and David arrive, you can imagine the local populace is like, oh, these are the grandsons of Andronicus I. He was a decent bloke. Uh, let's follow him. Um, <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's, um, yeah, no, 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 I know, I know. It's, you just have to remember yeah. how Andronicus is. And so when... I think this also explains why they're able to just kind of roll over these provinces, they arrive in Trebizond and then they just, they're able to just walk in. They arrive in mm. Sinope, but they just walk in. They arrive in Heraclea on the Pontus, they just walk in. It's only when they start to get toward Constantinople and these more central provinces to the capital that they actually start to face resistance, especially mm. from Theodore Lascaris that's actually yeah. managed to carve out his own domain. Um, but you shouldn't shouldn't underestimate how close uh, David does get Constantinople. He, he gets very close. Yeah, uh, with um, Sinardinos was actually a good leader. He may have actually he, besieged and taken Nicomedia. So yes, um, which and is, there was virtually no one in Mic Nicomedia at the time, so he could have just walked into it. Um, Yes, it, 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 they're very close. Um, mm. how, um, obviously, we're not in the realm of ultimate history here, but it'd be interesting. It's interesting thought as to 
uh, what could have happened if they'd taken the city. Um, mm. I the the way um, uh, the emperors uh, try to legitimise themselves, uh, especially David Komnemnos, which is why I I brought up earlier um, what exactly is his position. Here. Yes, because we have we may not have any coinage uh, for Alexius or David, but we do have seals uh, for David. And um, we have two seals. Um, you can find them on Dumbarton Oaks, uh, if, uh, the Dumbarton Oaks seal catalogue, uh, if anyone fancies uh, looking at them. But um, the way they legitimise themselves is through, of course, being a Christian empire, they use biblical imagery. And um, I, I do. Um, and David, of course, who better... Which which better biblical figure to to use than of course King David? David. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and so his seal has um, is, uh, invokes King David. One of them, one of them does. Um, it's just, it just says that uh, King David be the sure guardian, the correspondent of David Komnenos, descendant of the emperors, um, which is. Um, it is. It is. Uh, you know. It, it shows that there is. Um, there is a a a, a wish for legitimacy. Um, it isn't like some half uh, half attempt to just carve out their own kingdom. They they do want to get to be Roman emperors. They they they. Mm. The, the goal is Constantinople uh, at this point, and in my view, it's still the point until twelve eighty two. Um, it is at least David's goal, because Alexios does spend yeah, most of his time in Trebizond. Exactly, which is why I'm but, curious. I'm curious as to David's role in all this, Yeah, because there's another seal of his. Uh, I'd also counter myself by saying, but what was he doing? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we don't know. So he may have been doing something very legitimate, like, for instance, um, re taking the Crimean provinces yes at that time um, so I think although he isn't active it, I think it would be too much of a an over judgment to say he, he that was, he, he was wasn't doing nothing he wasn't nothing. doing nothing at all. yeah he, he couldn't have been the, the, the empire's the empire surviving mm. his death is proof that he doesn't do nothing no <laughs> we he retakes Sinope Yes, yes, he does. Yes. So he couldn't. He wasn't doing nothing at all. Um, so. And so. so I was just gonna. I was just gonna bring up the second second seal. Um, yeah, which, go ahead. Which um, there's no specific dates for this compared to the other one, and instead it uses um, Saint Eleutherios um, as born in the sort of purple. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, that that I mean, obviously, it isn't isn't that language isn't isolated to emperors, mm. isn't isolated to emperors. But it's it's an interesting, you know, is he inching towards taking it for himself? I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting. I thing. I think. Well, this is where we. Because so I know, I know I know we're going into all mm. we're going into and I don't, I don't mean to drag us in that direction, but David puzzles me. Um. The um, he he just he, he, what's he doing? It, it does puzzle hmm. me. Of course, you know, of course, advancing for the city. But what's the end goal? Is he just an opportunist, or is this a kind of well, yeah? I mean, okay, grand but, crusade for Constantine. I mean, there's, no. there's no there's no denying, of course, that you know, as uh, you know, they're brothers and they're Comnenian brothers. They know exactly what their fa what their name is. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, fratricide, you you know, usurpation from a brother, you know, that that, that isn't that is that that mm. isn't impossible when you look at Byzantine history. I think uh, how how I would describe David's relationship with Alexios is that um, so my my opinion is kind of based on what. 
Nikitas Konyatis says, because he was actually a contemporary historian yes, and hostile, yes, yes. Um, is that he calls David the ruler of Paphlagonia, mm. it, um... which implies to me that although Alexios had like, direct control over sort of the lands from Sinope to the Georgian border, David had direct control over Paphlagonia from Heraclea to Sinope. So I think, and being brothers, I think they were kind of working together because they do they do work together, or at least they they have a cordial relationship with each other. Although I don't know of Alexios ever actually helping David after he takes Heraclea, but I think I think because there is a lack of detailed evidence it's difficult to say one way or the yes. other i mean i mean as i mean the the, the most likely ex explanation is you know he's conquering it for his brother you know and mm. you know and they're in they're in contact by messenger and he's yeah. um so, that, that is the most likely explanation. we'll sort it out that. later kind of thing well i mean in all fairness alexis is, is the elder one um, yeah so you, you know it, but but then again, as I, I mean, so that is the most likely explanation. I, I don't mean to peddle mm. conspiracy theories, um, but you do have to remember, of course, there is not there is not there's not succession by primogeniture in the Byzantine Empire. It, no, it, it, it is is not eldest is not necessarily first. No, well, as, as shown in Trebizond, when Gaidon, of course, is emperor before John. Mm. Um, so um, it. So as I said, it's 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 because of lack of evidence, I guess, that I can question what David is up to. Yes. Um, whether or not, as I said, it, the most likely explanation is that you know they're being good Komnenian, good children of the Komnenoi, yeah, and are 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 trying to reclaim their birthright, so to speak. Um, I mean, you you could say as a kind of legacy of the Komnenian system that sort of. Everyone related to the imperial family works together for a, the common cause. Yes. They may have had something like that still going on. It's like let's work together, um, kind of thing. But again, lack of evidence, I'm afraid. One thing I do want to point out in uh, this is that in in uh, William Miller's Trebizond, the last Greek empire, which is kind of your standard English history of the yeah, empire, it is, he mentions it. in David's advance a guy called Sabas of Samson as being one of um, Theodore, not Theodore, of David's opponents. And um, in Vasiliev's article, he actually points this out as being a historical error. I think this is quite interesting. So, um, uh, so Sabas of Samson, which was another one of these uh, Roman princes that grabbed what they could um, in and around the fall of Constantinople, um, was formally believed to have taken Samson which is a city in the area of Amasos in uh not in the near Sinope um but the issue here is how did this person manage to take a city in the middle of Komnenian territory which they had already taken beforehand quite freely and then Theodore Lascaris goes and takes it for himself way away from his own empire it's kind of a bleep in logistics almost mm -hmm. so yeah. this problem is actually explained in the fact that Sabas did take Samson but it's not the city Samson that is called that today 
It's not the one in the Pontus. It is actually a city on the western coast of Asia Minor near the Meander Estuary, which is in the southwest of the country, just above Caria, which was originally called Pri Prien? Prien in ancient times. So Sabas and Samsum took this city in Asia Minor, so he would have been up against Theodor Mangarfus, Manuel Mavrizomes, and Theodor Lascaris, which would be far easier for Theodor Lascaris to take, because it is right in the same area as Nicaea. So, which makes a lot more sense, both historically and logistically. So, I think this is a very good case for why, if ever you see Sabas of Samson in the history of Trebizond, is just to ignore it, because this mm -hmm. isn't true. Indeed. It also means that from Heraclea to Trebizond, the Komnemni, the Komnemnoi had one continuous territory. They had one continuous land link between the two. Hmm, it, it, it doesn't and it last. Isn't, it doesn't last that long, but while it is there, it is a kind of it is big, so to speak. Um, oh yes, yes. Uh, yeah. I know there's a picture on Wikipedia of the Trebizond Empire all in pieces, so that's probably not quite the case. Anyway, I thought that was a historical note to uh, oh, oh, yes, yes, definitely. point out. One thing I do want to discuss with you, Mark, is what do you think of David Komnemnus's military credentials? <laughs> Um, he certainly has the ambition, and they certainly do well from Trebizond to Heraclea, but when they actually come up against organised military resistance mm, in um, the form of the Nicaeans and the Turks, the David's command of the Trebizontine armies and his Georgian allies is complete pants. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, obviously, you remember his, his, his ultimate defeat at the hands of Gaidon, I, um, mm. I mean, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I want to say about Gaidon first before... Uh, sure. Ga Gaidon was, I, I think, an underrated, very much an underrated general, I think. His, providing it's the same person, which I think it is, um, uh, the, the man who becomes emperor, um, his defeating of David... Um, no, I, I don't believe we, we have anything on it um, properly. Um, that, that it's we, a kind it's, of... Well, actually, it's, it is. It's... Um, uh, I think Nikitas Konyatis in a panegyric oh, yes. Yes, 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 to yes, yes, Theodore yes. goes into a little detail about yes. it. It's, uh, it's, it's the Battle of the Rough Ways. Mm, the Battle yeah. of... Um, in 1206, it is the Battle of the Rough Pass, as it is called, mm. where Andronicus Gidon, or Gidos, we don't really know which one it is properly, um, completely annihilates this force of 300 Latin mercenaries in David's army. And the destruction of this force completely cripples David's military capabilities. Yes. Um, but Andronicus was a very good commander of his, his exploits uh, as emperor. Yeah. Like, you know, his his conduct during the siege of 1222, um, once once you look through the uh, the uh, the dramatic effect um, and obviously the obvious religious motivation behind the nature of the narrative um, mm. it, you know he, he's definitely competent I would say quite good he was a quite a good general and for the time he was better than average I suppose um, was That's David good. bad? The, the thing you got to know about David his 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 army by this point was mainly mercenaries. 
Um, There's nothing wrong with mercenaries. No, 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 not at all. Um, I think there's something to the fact that when he loses his Latin mercenaries, his army just becomes completely. Mm. Um, was, is that ineffective? Gaidon, of course, did have the remnants of um, of some of the Asiatic um, forces at his disposal. Um, True. Well, the, La the uh, Nicaeans also had Latin mercenaries in there. Well, oh, no, I mean, I mean, guy. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Of course. Um, but Ga um, David, you know, he's he's been on campaign a while, mm. and obviously, I mean, these mercenaries were undoubtedly expensive earlier because Gaidon, when he becomes, has to debase the currency. Um, so either, well. Either I suspect somewhat that they w were starting to have money problems. You know that the, the, the mm. basing can't be. Uh... They'd also been on. He'd also been under siege for ages. Exactly. I suspect they were starting to run out of their money, um, and you, you know it, it. It takes you know months to go down the Silk Road. You know, you know trade is. Especially it, if he's getting his most of his money from mm, Trebizond. Yeah, there is. There's no quick way to get money. So it is. It, is, is built up consistently, but it's not like suddenly mountains of gold. Yeah. Um, I suspect he was running out of money. Um, and to, I, I'd also the say he's is, running out of troops he, as well. Yes, I, I, I was. But equal, equally, and he, the, he got as far as he did um, mm. against little opposition. But when he finally starts meeting opposition, you can see, like, you can see it sort of it, it unwinds, it unwinds pretty quickly for him. There's one disaster after the other. I think, um, I think there is a a point that either David himself was not particularly a good commander, or he lacked good military judgment. And I'd say well, this for well, a couple of reasons. One is that. It was him who appointed Sanardinos, who was a young and inexperienced commander, to lead a large part of his army, which probably also included the Georgian contingent, or a good portion of it, that Tamar had given them, against Nicomedia, and they go through the, the mountain passes in between Paphlagonia and uh, Bithynia, and they get absolutely destroyed by Theodore and uh, because David's given command to Synodonos mm. it may be he may have done this purely because of overconfidence perhaps because he'd been able to just walk over the opposition by this point um, um, but I mean you do have to t he's, he's very he is inexperienced mm. uh, it's David you know this is this is his first uh, I believe his first proper campaign um, yeah so he, he was what he's what against not, an 20, actual foe yeah 20 21 uh, something at this like that he, he, he's, he's not <laughs> he, he's, he's, he's not he's grizzled I, I do admit he isn't grizzled like Theodore quite is um, well, Theodore's not that grizzled either. But anyway, um, well, yeah, but but Theodore has a large part of the uh, a lot of the Roman elite with him. Um, yes, he does have a a bigger pool to um, draw from in terms of high command, because most high command was drawn from the aristocracy and. It, I suppose it kind of depends on who was a, who else was available to David. Unfortunately, we don't know. So no, um, it's <laughs> if, <laughs> it's if so often the problem with Trevisan. Yeah. Yes, uh, that we, we unfortunately we just do not know. A lot of this, a lot of the study of Trevisan requires a good deal of, uh, of speculation. Circum speculation based on the evidence as good as you can uh, manipulate it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Manipulated. <laughs> well, uh, uh, history is all about the manipulation of evidence, uh, mm. as in manipulation, as in obviously you got the joke that I meant it as a double meaning. <laughs> um, yes. 
Okay. So, what would be your final thoughts on David as a commander? I think mine are quite clear. Uh, well, I think I think Gaidon was better. I think David was inexperienced, but equally, even without any experience, I suspect he was running out of money because of, as I say, uh, uh, the, the the coins of Gaidon, and hmm. he was probably running out of troops also, and especially well, after. The- the defeat at Nicomedia. Yes. And, and then so especially maybe... after the rough way, uh, rough pass. And there's, there, there might have been a degree of overconfidence, but I, I, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure. Cause I, I've always viewed the campaign, um, as them rushing to take as much as possible in the, okay. ca- in the chaos and confusion of, of, uh, of the fall. Cause the, the fall of mm. the news would have reached, uh, cause the, cause, um, because they take um, cons- uh, they t- he because uh, Alexius takes Trebizond more or less in the same week as Constantinople falls. Um, I believe Constantinople falls April. I want to say April the twelfth, but that's probably wrong. Uh, but Trebizond. I can look it up if you want. Yeah, please do. Uh, Trebizond's uh, April the seventh. Um, uh, is when Alexius uh, gets it. Hold on. The Fourth Crusade took Constantinople in. Twelfth and the thirteenth of April. Yep, I just found uh, it. <laughs> um, Damn. So, oh, well. I, I was, I was, I'm seeing that my memory hasn't uh, <laughs> completely gone yet. <laughs> um, so, so you know, like obviously, you know, that is the the, the gap in the day should be noted. Trebizond is established before the fall of Constantinople, but mm. and there's no way for them, like you know, the, the news would have reached them a week after that. Yeah, you know, the, they they would know. When it, you know, but equally, I do think that the camp they they do they hear about the fall. They think, yes. Right. It'll probably be somewhere on the headlines. As, as much as possible. Yeah. As quick as possible, with the ultimate goal being Constantinople. Um, you know, I mean, because the Latin Empire is, you know, but at that point, there, the Latin Empire is not there yet, is it? They're 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 squabbling over who gets what. Uh, at mm. that point. Yes, um, it's uh, it's very it's very nice when when you see like the four, a map of the Fourth Crusade that someone's come up with, and it's very neatly sort of Nicaea, Epirus. It's like no, yeah. that's twelve oh five. Indeed, indeed. Um, yes. But yes, I he could have been an a, 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 an average or even good commander. Um, what I because mm. you know even good commanders lose battles. Um, it's just uh, Andronicus and Theodore were better. Yes. Perhaps. Um, yes. Yes. And he may. There may have been other extenuating factors. Okay, Mark. So I think we'll start to draw this one to a close. We've uh, been going on for near over an hour now. So oh, <laughs> I in quite quite. Um, so what I think we'll do is I have this nice little. Um, summation by Vasiliev from his Foundation of Trebizond article. I think I'll read that out and then we can give any last thoughts. Yeah. And then say tally ho. So, um, Alexander Vasiliev says When the expedition to seize Trebizond started from Georgia, neither Tamar nor her protégés, Alexios and David, had any idea of undertaking a campaign west to retake Constantinople from the Latins. After the capture of Trebizond, uh, there was little different. There was a uh, great difference in the character of the brothers, which made itself obvious. While Alexios remained in Trebizond, David, in his daring and successful campaign westwards in 1205, 
reached Nicomedia on the shores of the Sea of Marmara. At that time, no doubt, David had already set himself the goal of taking possession of Constantinople and restoring the Byzantine Empire, and he was on the point of carrying out his ambitious plan. Seeing David's success, Alexios also was seized with the idea of driving the Latins out of Constantinople. The energetic policy of Theodore Lascaris of Nicaea overturned their plans and deceived their hopes. David was forced to open negotiations with his former enemy, the Latin Emperor, sought, aid for, sought for his aid, and in 1206 declared himself his vassal. After this, a Trebizantine Comnemni, the Trebizantine Comnemni abandoned all plans against Constantinople. Western aid, however, was not strong enough to release them from the Nicene danger. Theodore Lascaris drove David east, and probably would have decisively overcome him had not the Turkish Sultan, Is al-Din, taken part in their rivalry. That's Kaikos Raw, by the way. Anxious to get an outlet on the Black Sea, the Sultan took possession of Sinope in, tw in 1214. David was slain, and Alexios, captured by the Sultan, compelled to pay tribute to him and render him military service. In other words, in 1214 the Empire of Trebizond became a vassal state to the Sultanate of Iconium. The capture of Sinope by Caicus Raw cut off the Trebizantine Empire from the Nicene and Latin empires. Henceforth, for a considerable time, Trebizantine foreign policy disconnected from the west of Asia Minor was limited to relations with Iconium and Georgia. Which I think is a good way of summing things up. Yes, in indeed. Yeah. Um. So, Mark, any last thoughts before we end? Um, namely that um, the just just as a um, you should never view history as inevitable. Um, mm. It's always well, it's always easier to see things in hindsight, of course. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, but Trebizond's foundation is by no means, you know, even, even once they've got the backing of Georgia, uh, is by no means assured throughout that period. Mm. Um, and Trebizond's position is by no means assured uh, in that period. Um, but what rapidly becomes apparent is partly the geographical location and at times some good luck on their part. Um, the Empire manages to survive the birthing. And the and usual the adroit military and diplomacy of the Byzantine Empire is of course, always in play. But always remember that this empire, which these two brothers started, does outlive uh, the Roman Empire. Um, and whether whether or not we can uh whether or not it's ever truly independent is a is a is for another day hmm. but the, the 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 empire of trebizond is a magnificent uh historical curiosity yes um, and i i would in, encourage you and also, uh, and your readers to uh, do, do, do do read up on it uh, yes i would agree uh, it's very fascinating um but I'd also like to uh, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me uh, to discuss uh, uh, Eastern Roman history with you uh, once again. Um, well, no problem, Mark. It's I a pleasure always, as always. I always enjoy being a guest on your magnificent show. Hopefully you'll be back again soon. Mm, thank you. And I think we shall wrap up there. Okay, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for watching. I'll be sure to have a look at your questions and uh, that I haven't been able to answer on this uh, at a later date. But uh, thank you all for taking part. I hope to see you all again soon. I have been your host, Daniel Maynard. My guest has been Mark, and this has been Eastern Roman History. <laughs>